Sociology at the end of the world. Part one. Imagining the end of the world. Imagining the end of the world is easy, as it is constantly being done for us. Start building your bunkers, folks, because we're all doomed. End of the world night, Saturday, if there is one, at 9 on 4. The end of the world is shown for us in film and television, novels, and even in an earlier era, radio. The world ends fantastically through aliens or zombies, or incredibly improbably through a comet or asteroid strike. Very much less improbably is the scenario of nuclear holocaust. Or pandemic disease. The fictional imaginings may be frighteningly realistic and solidly based upon scientific understandings. Alternatively, they may ridiculously misrepresent what is actually known about potential hazards. For example, here, a new ice age is brought on by global warming. This itself is actually a real possibility. But nonetheless, the film is absurd in its presentation of instantaneous freezing. Filmmakers and writers may be imagining the end of the world for us, but they are not creating the real collective fears from which such representations derive their roller coaster like, safely controlled thrills. People do not literally believe in zombies, but the seemingly ubiquitous nature of the zombie throughout film and television world nonetheless comes from something real. Dr. Penelope Ironstone, president of the Canadian Communication Studies Association, explains it like this. Our imaginings of a zombie apocalypse owe a lot to our anxieties about contagious infectious diseases in general and what are called emerging infectious diseases in particular. The process of becoming a zombie might best be imagined as a kind of contagious disease caused by an infectious agent like a virus, a bacterium, or a newer kind of infectious agent found to be the cause of bovine encephalopathy or mad cow disease, the prion. In fact, this is exactly what Robert Smith question mark argued when he provided a mathematical model of a zombie pandemic. He used the models of epidemics and pandemics used in public health and epidemiology for other contagious diseases like influenza in order to show how a zombie outbreak might be spread and what likelihood there would be of stopping it by means of public health initiatives. So there are realities underlying even our symbolic projections of anxiety. 
But how realistic are our perceptions of risks? Your chance of dying in a bathtub is about one in a million. Part two. Risks and realities. Let us begin by considering the fear the politicians most like to play upon. Terrorism. Ordinary people may become victims of acts of terrorism. The apparent randomness of the targets chosen and the extremity of the violence work to plant this fear in the minds of all of us. However, just living entails risk. The possibility of death or injury constantly confronts us in our daily lives. Nature may inflict them upon us. Other people may bring about calamity for us through their negligence or irresponsibility. We may bring pain or injury upon ourselves through accident. Or sometimes, bad things just happen. But few of us dwell upon such risks in the same way terrorism seems to excite the collective imagination. But what are the realities of probability with regard to this risk? Your chance of dying in a bathtub is about one in a million. Mm -hmm. And so terrorism is one in 3.5 million. So, with respect to some things, people's perceptions of risks are very disproportionate to their actuality. But on the other hand, there are some things they should be much, much more frightened of. The world is now two minutes closer to doom. It's now at 11.57. Today, unchecked climate change and a nuclear arms race resulting from modernization of huge arsenals pose extraordinary and undeniable threats to the continued existence of humanity. And world leaders have failed to act with the speed or on the scale required to protect citizens from potential catastrophe. But climate change and nuclear war are different sorts of risks. We will, or we will not, have a nuclear world war. And the results, of course, of even a fairly limited nuclear exchange would be catastrophic. Climate change is different. It is not a question of whether or not it will occur. It is already occurring. As it proceeds unchecked in any kind of meaningful way, its effects will become more frequent and severe. But we already have floods and droughts and hurricanes. It is just that causality in complex systems is quite complicated to discern with respect to particular events. Hurricanes and floods occur naturally. So, did this hurricane or this particular drought in California arise because of humanly caused global climate change? The answer is a definite... maybe. We only know for certain that we will have more extreme weather events in terms of both frequency and intensity. We know that the cost in lives and suffering as well the economic costs, will be severe. Will the sea level rises that are probabilistically predicted by the scientists submerge many of the world's small island states? We do not know that for sure. But we also don't know if it is not already too late. Will climate change end the world? That we do not know. But it certainly seems possible if something big is not done about it pretty soon. It is perhaps three minutes to midnight with regard to these risks. But the dark night of dystopia enveloped us much earlier. Part 3. The Dystopia Thesis the dystopia thesis is an analysis of both the present and future. 
Dystopian future realities are seen as emerging from a present day, where brutality, pain and suffering could scarcely get any worse for something like a billion people. The dystopia thesis, as well as chronicling the present day horror, argues that it will become increasingly exacerbated in the near future. The suffering, as well as becoming more intense, will become more widespread. Developing trends show newer and more frightening problems on a nightmare trajectory. Are we heading toward global apocalypse? This is not certain, but it is certain that ecological catastrophe looms as a likely future. Police spying, military oppression, widespread incarceration and even torture are present-day realities. How much worse can this get? We don't know for sure. What we do know is that it will get worse. Why is this so? It is so because of the way in which structural causality operates in the world. Structural causality operates in our dystopian world as structural violence. Starvation is an example of this. People do not starve because there is not enough food. Frequently, countries facing famine are still exporting cash crops to the richer nations. People starve because they do not have enough money to pay for food. People starve because of poverty. People starve because of economic inequality. And yet not only is how much inequality most people believe is ideal, very different from what they believe it to actually be now, but what it really is, is much, much greater than what they believe it to be. The treatment of disease is another example of structural violence. Millions of children die of easily treatable diseases for which they did not receive proper treatment. It is not that the drugs in such cases are inherently expensive to produce. It is that the profit margins required by the drug companies make the drugs prohibitively expensive for the poor. The poor essentially die of poverty. They die from the structural violence inflicted upon them by the world economy. Social inequality is not an accidental feature of our world political economy. It is intrinsic to it. But poverty is not the only feature of dystopia, past, present or future. Powerful socio-economic political forces are at work, pushing us collectively toward a future none of us would invite. A future of ecological catastrophe on a global scale. In the face of these forces, individuals feel powerless. Yet we are not entirely powerless. The problems are humanly caused, and thus, in theory at least, are amenable to human solution. but the system itself prevents a serious viable long-term solution to the problems even being attempted. Yes, people find it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. This is because of structural mystification. Part four. Structural mystification. the Civil War. Who won the Civil War? Um, we did? The South? <laughs> like the one in 1965 or what Civil War? Who won it? <laughs> it was 
even in it. <laughs> who was in it? Just tell me who was in it. That's the Confederates, right? Who is the vice president? Is that like a trick question? Nope. Who is Brad Pitt married to? Angelina Jolie. Uh, Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and who was he married to before that? Uh, I think it was uh, Jennifer Anderson. Jennifer Anderson. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. Yes, there is much the elites and ruling class do not want you to know. They want you to believe in your allegedly democratic institutions. They certainly would not want you to know the results of this Princeton University study. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just gonna quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. The theory of structural mystification asserts that knowledge and mystification are dialectical opposites. The political economic system allows for the production and dissemination of knowledge through institutions like the educational system, corporate and military research institutes, mass media, social media and others. However, all these institutions have embedded in them knowledge's dialectical opposite as well, structural mystification. Structural mystification is obfuscation and interference in learning and the production of knowledge. It is the prevention or restriction of knowledge's being disseminated. The American university students' ignorance concerning their country's history and politics is sadly not unusual. Nor is it unusual to see an ignorance of much that is crucially important combined with an extensive knowledge of trivia. Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. It is not simply that the educational system is on many levels badly failing, or that the media is focused upon the lowest common denominator or mindless entertainment. No, it is far more problematic than that. It is, as George Carling said, what the ruling class above all does not want is well-informed, critically thinking individuals. And the system is structured in such a way that remarkably few are produced. 
Well, another week, another story about scientists in Canada being muzzled. So we're in a position right now where the status of scientific knowledge in Canada is itself um, in crisis. Critics say some topics are particularly sensitive to the government. Climate change, greenhouse gas emissions and how it relates to oil sands development. There is a war on science and scientists in this country. It's hard not to laugh at some okay. people's ignorance. Name one country in Europe. I don't know. But there is a very sad and also sinister side to this. What is the largest country in South America? In South America? Africa? Africa. Just like poverty, ignorance is not accidental. And where is Iran? Like South Europe or something? South I don't Europe. Know. I don't know. <laughs> Just as poverty is an aspect of structural violence, so too is violence an aspect of structural mystification. Ignorance is not innocent. It allows people to be easily manipulated by the politics of fear. Part 5 The Politics of Fear. Institutions of cultural production, print media, television and radio and the film industry take our understandable and reality-based fears and transform them. Job insecurity, an ever-increasing reality for more and more people, is given an inaccurate target to blame immigrants. Time and time again we hear illegal immigrants are taking jobs from struggling Americans. Racist associations between poverty and dirt and disease are subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, provided for the minds of the ignorant. A legitimate concern for their own futures, existential insecurity, manifested as fear and uncertainty concerning their continuing abilities to provide for themselves and their families, is given focus through newscasts and cultural products symbolically, in the form of a fear of the other. The other, who is different in small ways, physically or culturally, becomes someone to be feared, despised, hated. I'm afraid of Americans. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid I can't help it. I'm afraid I can't. Our quite rational fear of disease symbolically rendered as the frightening zombie or sexualized as the vampire is also utilized in the machinery of dominance. The zombie and the vampire are not just Ebola and AIDS, they are the boogeyman. In the foreign country, we must bomb. It is sometimes forgotten that there are two sides to the politics of fear. One side, as we have seen, is the generation of false flags, of non-existent or grossly over-exaggerated threats to distract us from what should be our real concerns. This is, in a sense, another side of structural mystification. The dialectic of terror. There are real reasons to be afraid. The elite use that fear and the actuality of force behind it to keep us in check. Knowledge is power. Seize him. Cut his throat. 
stop. Wait. I've changed my mind. Let him go. Step back three paces. Turn around. Close your eyes. Power is power. This shows that what is necessary to change the world in a positive way is not only compassion and a concern for others and future generations, It is not only a knowledge of what is, what could be, and what should be, but it is also courage. <coughs> courage is, of course, about taking action in the face of fear, but courage is fueled by hope. Part 6 Hope Imagining the end of capitalism The future is coming Not only can we easily imagine the end of the world and dystopia but we can also easily imagine the future as utopia where our current problems are solved by technology. This is hope, but it is false hope. Technology directed by capital serves profit, not human need. It seems as though even those most painfully aware of social inequality and injustice cannot really imagine the end of capitalism. It is as if today the utmost radical horizon of our imagination is global capitalism with a human face. We have the basic rules of the game, we make it a little bit more uh, uh, human, more tolerant, with a little bit more welfare and so on and so on. But we must do better than this. When we imagine the future, we must have a whole new mindset. We must first imagine an ecologically harmonious, democratic eco-communism. We must raise this shining vision of the future in our minds. Then we must fight and work to make it a reality. We need a global consciousness to make the connections between apparently diverse issues. So yes, we can easily imagine the end of the world, but it is far more important to imagine and struggle to create the beginning of true civilization. <laughs> <laughs>